Thank you. These are the records of my birth 35 years ago. For most people, this piece of paper and this gender assignment, it's something that you never think twice about. But for millions of transgender people, this changes the course of their lives forever. I knew from an early age that my gender identity did not match the biological sex I had been assigned. Although I had been born with a penis and testicles, I always felt that something was not right. I was stuck in a body that was not mine. I was stuck in a society that refused to accept the truth about my gender identity. You cannot tell someone is transgender by just the appearance. We are diverse, we come from different backgrounds, but we share a lot in common. We face numerous challenges, such as stigma, high levels of violence, discrimination, and health issues. I never knew how difficult it would be to transition. Transitioning is emotional, social, medical, and legal. And for most in the transgender community, they go through this process and life after alone. I started my transition just before college. And my parents, like parents of other transgender people across the world, found this unacceptable. They even refused to pay for my education, knowing very well that I could not do it myself. They demanded that I shave my hair, and I submitted. I loved education, but my first year of college broke me down. I was drowning in depression. I was living a lie. And so I began my social transition. I started off by dressing in female attire in accordance with my gender identity. And it was unfortunate because my family ended up cutting ties with me. I never even had an opportunity to pick my personal belongings. In fact, these are the only two pictures I have from my past. Later on, I began my hormone replacement therapy. But if you think self-acceptance is difficult, public acceptance is even harder. Many people refused to acknowledge my gender identity. I was refused medical attention and hormone therapy. I even had to self-medicate myself with estrogens. Getting employed was impossible. I was often accused of stealing someone else's identification and academic documents. So I eventually ended up in the village alone and extremely poor. Most people, most transgender people, end up ending their lives rather than live under the constant persecution that comes with being their true selves. Suicide rates among transgender people <coughs> sorry, are extremely high. Uh, familiar faces such as uh, friends, uh, families, and neighbors become their oppressors. And our government rewards our oppressors. 
I have been raped. I have been deserted by my friends and family. I have been stripped from my clothes by people who wanted to determine my sex. I have been thrown in filthy cells with the male population. You name it. But I am here in front of you because against all odds and despite losing everything, I managed. <laughs> but I could not have done it without the support of my grandmother and a few others who believed in freedom. I am not bitter, but it is my mission to share my strength and story with others who face the same challenges and struggles that I faced. In uh, 2008, I founded the Transgender Education and Advocacy to promote the rights of transgender people in Kenya. Over the last 10 years, we have grown our membership to more than 100 trans people and allies tackling some of the toughest problems we face in the country. If you think it's hard to, to engage uh, governments to promote your rights and freedoms in free and democratic countries such as the US and Norway, then think twice. Our government is not shy of cracking down on minorities, the opposition, independent media, and dissent. Our elections are often rigged by those in power. Authorities constantly use violence for their ends. It is a government that cannot be held accountable for their actions. Take my case as an example. In 2014, the year 2014, the High Court of Kenya ordered the government to change names and gender markers in identification and academic documents of transgender people in Kenya. They refused to do so. They even refused to register my organization. The transgender debate continues to receive some attention in Kenya and in Africa. However, it's a very young and under-resourced movement. We have achieved modest success, but a lot need to be done. We want a society where people respect people's gender identity. We want a society where transgender people can compete on a level playing field without stigma, discrimination, and violence. And that is why organizations such as T, the HRF, and others exist to make it possible for us to live in freedom someday. And you can help too. It doesn't matter if your career has a direct human rights focus or not. You can make a difference. In your pockets, using your phones, you have the ability to reach thousands through social media and show support to your local transgender people and communities. Reach out to them. Listen to their stories and learn more about their struggles. Because by you adding your voice to this conversation, it helps us in ending transphobia. I earlier mentioned that this is a struggle that most of us face alone. 
But today, standing here in front of you all, united as one, I do realize that I am not alone. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. On the 4th of April 2017, I was in a cell in the prison in Yaoundé, listening to my father's body being lowered into the grave. I was not allowed to attend the funeral. Neither was I allowed to show any emotion in jail. A couple of weeks earlier, I was arrested, cuffed, blindfolded, and transferred to Yaoundé. I was thrown in a cell with 12 members of the notorious Boko Haram terrorist group. Yeah, they kept me in a cell because I too was accused of terrorism, incitement of civil war, and group rebellion, amongst others. But my only crime, my only crime in the eyes of the government was the fact that I had led a peaceful protest against the 56 years of marginalization, oppression, and suppression that my people, the Anglophones in Cameroon, suffered in the hands of the predominantly French-dominated Francophones. Life wasn't easy. I had to go through the pains and sufferings of being in jail. To be an Anglophone in Cameroon is not very easy. English and French are supposed to be our official languages. But because of the majority of Francophone-speaking Anglophone, um, Francophone-speaking Cameroonians, English has been relegated to the background. Cameroon seems very peaceful from the outside. But to the average Anglophone, it's a very polarized society. It seems as if there are two Cameroons in one. The majority dominates the minority. To the English-speaking Cameroonians, Words have been used to describe us as terrorists, the enemies in the house. Bamenda, Anglo fools. These words might seem very unimportant, but they take a different nuance when the Francophone dominated military is sent to repress our people when they freely express their opinions. Cameroon, historically, was the French and the English. The two peoples came together, represented in the two star and the flag. By 1975, the government removed one of the flags, one of the stars on the flag. This clearly showed that they were removing the Anglophone identity. And in 1984, they changed the name from Republic of Cameroon to, from La République du Cameroon to Republic of Cameroon. This was a name that the French had used prior to us coming together. It signified a lot. They expanded, extended their dominance to our culture, to our language, and to our institutions. The French common law, the French civil law dominates in our courts. There being an erosion of the English common law. Francophone teachers who cannot understand or speak in English are teaching our students. You cannot understand the pain that the children go through. And because they control the military and the police, it is clear from government attitude that they are out 
to eliminate all form of dissent in Anglophone Cameroon. This has resulted to the killings of more than 2,000 Anglophones. The burning down of hundreds of villages by predominantly Francophone military. More than 1,000 Anglophones are currently detained in the jails in Cameroon would have a million internally displaced. About 50,000 are currently living in Nigeria as refugees. In Cameroon, we see the division, we see the elimination, we see the classification and the extermination. But we're in denial of what is happening. 25 years after the genocide in Rwanda, what is gradually happening in Cameroon is seen as a new normal. But I say no, this cannot be normal. This is not normal is. In Africa or in any part of the world, we cannot accept that. Growing up as a child, I was inspired by my father, who was a trade unionist. He fought for the rights of the Anglophone workers. He protected their rights. I got the inspiration and I started writing against the injustices, the marginalization and oppression that my people were suffering. As a result of that, I was expelled in high school for so-called subversive writing. But I did not give up. It gave me the impetus to continue the fight for the people. This led to the creation of the Center for Human Rights and Democracy in Africa, an organization that protects and promotes the human rights of the people. Subsequently, I was voted president of the FACO Lawyers Association. And in my capacity as the president of the FACO Lawyers Association, I rallied Anglophone Lawyers Association for us to call for a peaceful protest because we had issued several memos to the government and they had never replied. And on the 3rd of November 2016, we organized one of those peaceful protests. We were tear gassed, we were beaten, we were dragged to the mud. We were humiliated. Our basic and fundamental rights were violated. But we did not give up. We continued the struggle. But over time, I realized that we had to build a society. Not all Francophones hated us. Some showed us love. And we started working with Francophone civil societies to build synergy across the board, to let the Cameroonians understand that we can fight the, the struggle, we can find a solution to the crisis if both of us speak the language of non-violence. To be honest, it was not easy to work with Francophones. How could I have worked with people I felt disrespected us? Would they not, would, would, would they not love us? But over time, being in jail and the way the Francophone lawyers and Anglophone lawyers defended us made me to reconsider my position. And today, I'm at the forefront, working with Francophones and Anglophones to see how we can find a solution. To the average Francophone, especially to the government in power, I'm considered as a radical because I bring out the atrocities that the government is committing. And to my Anglophone brothers, when I talk about peace, when I talk about reconciliation, when I talk about cooperation and dialogue, they consider me to be too moderate. It's not been an easy route. Even when my father's house was burnt and my life threatened, I still did not give up. I still did not fold my arms. I continue what to me is my mission, to speak truth to power, to help in finding a solution to the crisis. As we gather here today in Oslo, my wish is that the situation happening in Cameroon should not be considered as normal. But all of us should look at it as unacceptable levels of loss of human dignity. Each and every one year can make a change. We of the Oslo Forum, the Oslo Freedom Forum, can find a solution. You can find a solution to the crisis. Let all of us join our hands and support the suffering people in Cameroon. Let us rise up against tyranny. Let us rise up against dictatorship. And let us ensure that we leave the world a better place than we made it. Thank you.
I admit that I am a woman with privileges. However, I will not forget the women who do not have the same personal freedom. My responsibility is to leverage my privilege so that I can help other women earn their rights and freedom. So these are the words of Lujain, who's been in jail for one year and 13 days. And I'm here today because I'm seeking justice for my dear sister Lujain, whose name means Pearl, by the way. Our Pearl, Lujain. So we're siblings, of, we're six siblings, and we're a family that's, you know, moving around between Saudi and France. But of us all, it's Lujain who turned to be activist. And frankly, I have no idea how that happened. She was always asking questions and questioning all the time. In hindsight, that should have been a hint for things to come, that she will be leading and advocating for women's rights. So by 2012, she started to ask in public the same question she asked in private, why women don't have equal rights to men in Saudi Arabia. She then acted on her words, and she co-led a campaign for women to drive back in 2013. She was also arrested for 73 days back in 2014 when she was simply trying to defy the ban on women to drive. In September 2017, I was so proud that Lujain and her colleagues made history when Saudi Arabia decided to lift the ban on women to drive. However, no one could have imagined that Lujain and her colleagues would be the first victims of their own success. By 2018, Lujain was attending the University of Sorbonne when she was doing her master's in sociology. That was in Abu Dhabi. In March of that year, Lujain was kidnapped from the UAE when she was pulled over on a highway by the secret, by the secret police. They placed her in a private jet and they flew her to Saudi Arabia against her will. She was detained for two nights, but she was eventually released. One month later, she was arrested again on a crackdown when the secret police, or the state security we call it, came to the house and arrested her. And these are armed men who came to the house with no permits or warrant. So we tried to stay silent and we kept quiet because that's what we were asked to do. And when they were arrested, that was part of a crackdown that targeted so many women, including Aziz Al Yusuf and Iman Al Nafjan. And later on, they, were, they arrested other women, such as Samar Badawi and Asima Asada. So for more eight months, Lujain didn't know what the charges were. She had no idea why she was arrested. Nobody knew that. And we tried to stay silent because we thought that was the best way to be. But we were also forced to be silent, and that's what we were asked to do. So for instance, we have this Saudi Norwegian who's running a think tank in DC. He tweeted the other day saying that it is better for the siblings of Lujain to remain silent because that is provoking the government by speaking out. So we did what we were expecting. We remained silent for eight months. And we took all the steps that, was we, that we were supposed to do, which is following all the official channels. And we took her case to the public prosecutor, the Ministry of Justice, the Ministry of Interior, and even the Royal Court to get her out. All of our efforts were remained 
silent. We were not able to get a response from the government. And she was tortured at that time while my family was kept in the dark. In March of 2019, after 10 months of her arrest, Lujain was finally taken to the court. But it's not any court. It's the specialized court. It's the court that deals with terrorism cases. Think of it, terrorism cases. But just the night before, when she was supposed to get to start her first hearing, we got a call from the state security saying that the court will be moved from the terrorism court to the, just a normal ter uh, criminal court. That is, by the way, not constitutional, and it's not usual. And I learned so many things from this case that there is no transparency and there is no respect for the rule of law. So what, what we did, so we have this, a newspaper. So these are the charges, actually, that Lujain is, is, is facing. Contacting human rights organizations, contacting foreign journalists, contacting diplomats, and even applying for a job at the United Nations. These are not jo jokes, by the way. These are official charges. So this is a local newspaper. It's a Saudi newspaper. It's called Al Jazeera. And as you can see, they labeled my sister and other women as traitors. Think of it, traitors. We found out that Lujain was being tortured and sexually harassed in a secret prison for six weeks. She was electrocuted, flogged, and even waterboarded. The man who was in charge of that and who was overseeing the torture is Saud al Ghattani. He is the top advisor of the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. He said to my sister that I will kill you and I will cut your body into pieces. But before I do that, I will rape you. Later, the public prosecutor denied any of this took place. But the truth is, I'm not an activist and I never wanted to be. But the legal system in Saudi Arabia really failed us. After my sister was arrested, we followed all the official channels, and we went by the book. But what I really don't understand is why Lujain and others are being punished for the things that they are asking in which Saudi Arabia says it wants to do. Genuine reform cannot happen without the real reformers. So Lujain the other day said to my parents when they visited her that because they damaged my reputation, I feel it's better for me to remain in jail forever because what they did to me was so horrific and they destroyed my life. So if you believe in Lujain's cause is just, tweet about her, talk about her, and share her story and her colleague's story as well and help us free Lujain. Help free the poor. Thank you. We just heard the outrage of a brother seeking justice for his sister. Let's all stand with Walid and call for the release of Lujain. When we heard about the crackdown on women activists in Saudi Arabia, we were outraged too. 
But what can you do when you're outraged? You take action. So the Human Rights Foundation partnered with Manal Sharif, former Oslo Freedom Forum speaker, and one of the leaders of the Women to Drive campaign. She had this idea of driving across the U.S. to raise awareness on the case of Lujane and other women activists in prison back home. The Crown Prince has been receiving so much praise for cosmetic change he's introduced in his country. So we felt it was important to highlight the real issues that these brave women were fighting for, ending the male guardianship system and equal rights. So with the help of one of our generous donors, HRF uh, was able to turn idea into action. And for three weeks in April, we drove across the United States hosting events and speaking engagements to raise awareness for the, uh, for the situation of Lujain and the other Saudi activists who are still held in prison without charges. And I was fortunate enough to accompany Manal on the entirety of the trip. And I can say firsthand that traveling 4,000 miles across the country with 10 people in two different cars, we really formed a bond that was pretty unbreakable. And you find the commonality amongst people who on paper might seem very different. I was fortunate enough to welcome Manal to my home state of Alabama, where we learned how her struggle against what she calls gender apartheid in Saudi Arabia so closely mirrored the struggle of Rosa Parks and her fellow activists against the system of racial segregation in the American South. We also met with many members of the Saudi diaspora, and I witnessed firsthand the cruel actions that the Saudi government can take to silence those even living abroad specifically by threatening the safety of their family who still, ex who still lives in Saudi Arabia. So an idea that was initially started to raise awareness for a few individual activists quickly morphed into something that was more of a critique of an entire system of oppression, of the male guardianship system, and of the existence of Saudi Arabia as one of the last absolute mon monarchies on the planet. And we're already seeing impact. Millions of people saw the media coverage about the drive. And while on the drive, three female activists were released from prison. Pressure does work. We're far away from reaching our goals for this campaign. But as Manal said on this stage, the rain starts with a single drop. Ladies and gentlemen, the Freedom Drive. First day of the drive, we are driving from San Francisco to LA and this is Bixby Creek Bridge. Phoenix, Arizona. This is Birmingham. My name is Manal Sharif, I'm from Saudi Arabia. I'm launching a campaign, the Freedom Drive, and I'm driving cross country here in the US to bring awareness around my friends who are in jail today in Saudi Arabia. This drive is to really raise awareness about this violation against human rights and women's rights in my country. Starting from San Francisco, ending the drive in the capital with a protest in front of the Saudi embassy. In 2018, the ban on women driving was officially lifted by the Saudi government, making us the last country on earth where women were able to drive. The same year, the women rights activists who fought for years to lift this ban were arrested, were imprisoned, were put in solitary confinement, and recently we learned that they were subject to torture in secret prisons by the Saudi government. It really concerns me that the world doesn't see the violations for human rights and women's rights in my country. My hope is this campaign will help in the release. Why in the US? because the close allies between the Saudi government and the US government. I just want to say something. It's, we're trying to take things lightly. We're trying to have fun. We're trying to just see the big picture. But it's really heavy on me, heavy on my heart, that my friends who fought with me are all in jail today and being tortured. The spokesperson of uh, the Saudi embassy in DC uh, just tweeted, the embassy of Saudi Arabia in Washington notes the US tour of Ms. Manal Sharif and welcomes the opportunity for her to meet the new ambassador, Princess Rima bin Tibetta, when she takes her post. I'm happy to meet her and this is really a good sign. My demands are simple. The immediate unconditional release of the women's rights activist in jail.
We're going to Stockton, Texas. That's three, 673 miles away from here. <laughs> One of the major obstacles for women to get their economical independence and find jobs was the mobility. We live in a country with no public transportation, no pedestrian cities, we can't even ride bikes. So driving was the only mean for women to get to their jobs. You can drive your own car, you can drive your own life. We're driving under the rainbow! Isn't this amazing? The driving in Arabic it means qiyada. It's the same word for leadership. We say, drive your own life. My hope from this drive is not only to raise awareness about the women's rights activists in my country, but it's also to revisit all the women's rights activists throughout history that have been forgotten. Women before us, we stood on their shoulders. Women after us will stand on our shoulders. This program was only made possible through the union of HRF, one of our donors, and a brilliant activist who is brave enough to stand up against tyranny. We as an organization are always open to new ideas and new partnerships. If you have any ideas as to how you can help us further our fight against oppression, please feel free to contact any of the HRF staff that you have met uh, or reach out to me or Celine directly. Uh, I invite you to unite with us. Thank you. This time I am not able to see your faces, but I'm going to have everyone stand up, take a little break from sitting, and let's just pretend like we're just waking up for the first time. Let's stretch, stretch out our sides and shake out our hands. Get the blood flowing before the next few sessions. All right, and this might be a challenge, but we're just going to jog in place. <laughs> Maybe the first time you've done this all conference. <laughs> all right, jog in place. And now just be still and see how still you can be. What we're going to do is we're going to balance on the front of our feet. Put all the weight, shift all the weight to the front, shift all the weight to the back. Ooh, it looks really cool to see everyone shift. <laughs> shift to the right, shift to the left, and then see if you can evenly distribute the weight on the bottoms of your feet. So simple. We're gonna do what's called sukshma yoga. So this is very, very small movements that can eliminate a lot of stress. So this is great for anyone who's looking at a computer or generally feels tension in the body. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our index finger and our thumbs, and we're just gonna press, pinch and press along the eyebrows. Don't worry about smudging makeup or anything. <laughs> all right, and now we'll just take the thumbs and we'll press all along the eye socket. So really give your eye socket, we store so much stress just around the eyes. You might start to feel some warmth in the face. All right, now we're going to take three fingers, open them out slightly, and just press down along the jaw. You might start to feel some knots. And just massage those, the jaw, the, the side, yeah. All right, and quickly, we've got a few more seconds here. Let's pinch our ear lobes and we're going to press down so there's a pressure point in our ear lobe that's related to awareness so we'll press that and make sure we're super awake for the next sessions shake out the hands shake out the body like jello all right and enjoy the rest of your Oslo Freedom Forum <laughs> thank you
Hi, hi, hi. My name is Srđa and this is Jamila Rokib. It is our pleasure to introduce probably the most inspiring moment of this all, which is presenting the Václav Havel Prize for Creative Descent. The Václav Havel Prize for Creative Descent was established in 2012 by the Human Rights Foundation with the support of Dagmar Havlova, the widow of the late great Czech poet, playwright, dissident, and international statesman. Mr. Havel served as chairman of HRF from 2009 until his death in 2011. And this prize was established to honor his legacy and to celebrate those who, at great risk to themselves, defy dictatorship. The prize comes in the shape of amazing statue. Don't try to lift it, it's very heavy. Which is in the shape of the goddess of democracy erected by a brave student of Tiananmen in 1989. The goddess embodies the power, the creativity, the resilience of the people in the face of dictatorship. We are going to start by introducing our this year's laureates. And unlike last year, you're not going to listen to us. You're going to watch the real work on the screen. Our first laureate is coming from Venezuela. Let's greet her. Muchísimas gracias por uh, este premio. Thank you very much for this prize. Um, lo recibo en nombre de la Venezuela que lucha por ser libre. I receive it in the name of a Venezuela that struggles to be free. Un premio a la disidencia creativa. A prize to the creative dissidents. Porque disentir es el mejor verbo para conjugar la libertad. Because dissenting is the best verb to conjugate liberty. Disentir es la llave que abre la experiencia creativa. Dissenting is the key that opens the door to, cre to creativity. Disentir crea nuevos espacios y nuevos puntos de vista. Dissenting creates new spaces and new points of views. Disentir es el mayor acto de libertad que puede tener un ser humano. Dissent is the highest act um, that a human being can carry out. Disentir es discernir. Dissenting is discerning. Disentir con dibujos, con textos, con acciones, con humor y con mucha esperanza. Dissenting with texts, with drawings, with cartoons, with actions brings hope. Sería imposible soportar esta tragedia sin humor y sin reflexión. It would be impossible to bear this tragedy without reflection. Hoy nos reunimos aquí alrededor de esta figura con forma de mujer. Today we, we gather around uh, this prize which is made of a, of a woman. La diosa de la democracia. The goddess of democracy. Figura que representa la esperanza, la luz y la libertad de muchos pueblos hermanos. A figure that represents the light and the hope and the freedom of sister nations. Hoy mi compromiso con los derechos humanos se hace más grande. Today, gracias a ustedes. my commitment with human rights becomes far greater thanks to you. Václav Havel dijo, la esperanza no es la convicción 
de que las cosas saldrán bien, sino la certidumbre de que lo que hacemos tiene sentido sin importarnos el resultado final. Václav Havel said, this is a long one. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a, a former chairman of the Human Rights Foundation, I have to get this quotation right. Um, hope is not the conviction that things will turn out right, but the certainty that what we do, um, we do without caring what the result will be. Nos toca entender que sí, sí hay luz al final del túnel. It, it, it's up to us to realize that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Aunque estemos transitando una larga oscuridad. Even though we may be going through great darkness. Sigamos, sigamos en la resistencia creativa. Let, let us continue, continue in this creative resistance. Frente a el monstruo totalitario. Against the totalitarian monster. No vamos a descansar hasta lograr una we're, we're not going to rest Venezuela until we achieve libre. A Venezuela that is free. En un mundo mejor. Our next laureate is not an individual, but a group of young, brave musicians from Thailand. Here's a video about their work. Thank you very much. I have uh, something to say out of my chest, just to a few minutes, that's okay? First of all, we thank Human Rights Foundation for giving us this award, and thank for you all. Throughout the last 13 years, Thailand went through two coups, four major protests that end with dead civilians. Many are jailed, some dead in jail. Some fled the country, some refugee returned home with their dead body. Many are lost. Not to mention all the incidents that harm, live, and property of political activists. The media and the love of people call it political crisis, or tragedy as you may, but we call it a state crime. Nevertheless, these poor long incidents have shown us that our number of people who would never give in to the authority and fight on till now. And last year, we formed the Rabagandic dictatorship. Without those people, 
who keep fighting, we never know if we would be here today. To all of you who fight for democracy in Thailand, you brought us this award. <laughs> we thank all in our work, especially the music video director, Mr. Tilawat Luchintam, my bandmate, Shevik Boy, the music composer, and our friends, Alex Face, who designed a meaningful cover for us. Our hearts go to you all. Last year, Thailand's GDP had a growth of 4%. It should mean we had a better living under the military government. But when you walk on the street, you would hear the people more about their poverty. What does it mean? It means the wealth goes somewhere else. The rich go richer and the poor get poorer. We can't deny that this really directly to the junta, who's spending the public money but with no link or power of accountability to the people. It's made so ridiculous that in all our rustless world today, there are so many people who are hungry. The hunger relates directly to the political authority. When we starve for the food, we indeed starve for power, the power that should belong to all of us equally. The Thai people express their hunger through the general erection under the crooked rules. Despite obstacles from the efforts to extend the regime, we finally got a fragile parliament today. We believe the fight is not ending. People who are in hunger for justice and for the power to govern themselves have shouted round and clear. And for the dictator, sorry, we're hungry. All people unite. Thank you very much. Then my friend Rupert P has something to say too. Please listen. This is uh, my weapon. กูเป็นชนชั้นปกครองกูมองพวกมึงเป็นเบี้ยล่างกูมีสิทธิ์ทําทุกอย่างกูทําเหี้ยได้เลี่ยล่าดขังพวกคิดกบฏกูทําได้
Yes, you can arrest the author, you can expel the author, but his songs and ideas are living even in a press country that Egypt is today. Meet Rami. <laughs> Thanks, Dari. Thank Thanks, Thank Thanks. Thanks. Dear friends, I, I want to thank Oslo Freedom Forum and Human Rights Foundation. Um, I'm really honored to received the Vaslav Havel Prize for Creative Descent and to share it with all the freedom fighters that received it before me and all the ones that will follow. Nothing can be done alone and I'm so grateful of having amazing people around me that have been believing in me and supporting my message along the way and they are big part of the path of the artist talking to you now. But because not everywhere are people who support human rights being awarded but punished instead, I will not be able to mention their names, not to cause harms at the moment. But there is one name that I will mention, and it's my friend, like a brother, the poet Galal Bahiri that is in jail at the moment, serving three years sentence because of a song we created together and also because of his unreleased poetry book. I'm sending all the strength and energy from here to him and sharing the prize with him. In addition, I'm sharing the prize with all the people that believe in my message and my music. I want to thank my family, I want to share the prize with my mom, with my father, my brothers, my sister, my son, my partner, and my manager. And I want to say thank you. And without you, I wouldn't be standing here. Being a political artist is tough, especially when you're living under a dictatorship, fighting against a big evil machine that constantly proves knowing how to cause pain to us people. I experienced physical and mental pain, but luckily I was always able to digest and continue. I experienced the power and the victory. As well, I learned how to accept loss and knowing that loss is not the end of the story. And that the power is for the people when we stand for ourselves. Revolution also taught me the hardest lesson in life, which is the path of changing the world is full of sacrifices. Since I moved to Scandinavia, I took parts in seminars, workshops, artist talks, and I even received some awards. I got lots of support 
but I also found many countries and organizations that have their own agenda and don't understand. I found out that the freedom of expression organizations are not all neutral. I found out that many of the organizations have um, many blind spots. You can call it like a um, selected focus. When they focus in Muslim countries or so-called socialist countries, no doubt these countries are suffering and facing violating human rights systematically. But, for example, states could be only criticizing Iran and, or focus on Cuba and why they don't talk about many other countries, and that's what I call the selected focus that we don't need. Europe, last week, elected the new EU parliament, and this parliament has a dangerous right wing, nationalist wind sweeping in. It's getting dangerous. The artistic freedom and media in many countries in Europe, like Poland, like Hungary, is at risk. Media freedom in Italy is at risk, even in France. The right wing want to take over the artistic freedom and would love to control artists' work. So even European democracy is no longer a guarantee for freedom of expression. So simply we need to fight for the universal rights all over the world, with no exceptions. Last but not least, <laughs> thanks. 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 Last but not least, I will talk about music and the power of the music. I'm so grateful that I got the chance to take a part with my music in a real movement, a real revolution that happened in Egypt in 2011, in Tahrir Square, Cairo. I was able to experience the power of the music on the spot the power of change that music can do, and how music can unite people. The best scene ever I saw with my eyes of seeing people that would never have even a conversation together because of a different background or where they come from. And seeing these people in one place as one human being, having one voice, singing together, even if they don't have a common language sometimes. It's so powerful. It's the best thing ever. I learned through this journey that governments and dictatorships are so scared of art and music, because simply it's the only thing that they can't stop. They can't come inside the artist's head and stop the creative process or the creative force. Simply, when the song is out, there is no single power on this planet that can stop it from spreading. Music is the most and strongest peaceful weapon on Earth when we want to fight peacefully against dictatorship. So, simply, this planet needs more and more political art. Thanks. Thank you. Can I have the word? I will perform words that are written by Václav Havel. I took one of his quotes that is very powerful, and I will share it with you now. Thank you. Mm-hmm. 
I really do inhabit a system in which words are capable of shaking the entire structure of governments where words where words where words where words can prove mightier than ten military divisions yeah 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 I really do inhabit a system in which words are capable of shaking the entire structure of governments where words where words where words can prove mightier than ten military divisions yeah 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 We've heard many stories about tough times, dictatorship, oppression. I'm so happy that we could share this moment of joy and creativity with you. Once again, think about freedom, fight for democracy, and never ever forget to be joyful and creative. It is the hope that will lead us to the change. Once again, a large applause for our laureates. Hi everyone, my name is Alexandra and I'm the director of the Elsa Freedom Forum and we just want to say thank you to everyone here and also watching online for participating in this year's event. It's been so incredible to see how all of these come together and to expand our community just one more time. The Alza Freedom Forum is in its 11th year, and we've been so excited to see how, in Norway, we've engaged new audiences and partnered with the city of Oslo, as well as with the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, to bring in new programming, such as Defending the Defenders, which is actually going to be our last session today at City Hall at 4 o'clock. Honestly, being on stage with Leila Hussein is such an honor, and we want to thank our sponsors and supporters for enabling causes like Layla's, as well as so many others who have come here to the Elsa Freedom Forum. Thank you for all that you've done. This event wouldn't be possible without you here. As an activist, as an activist, this platform has been extremely important to me. I was given the opportunity many, many times where I got to share the stories of over 200 million women who, who have undergone a practice called female genital mutilation. However, I'm also the activist who's introduced the vagina cupcakes to this stage, which I'm very <laughs> proud of. <laughs> hey, HRF is extremely important to us activists, especially because this is a very safe space that was created for us. I've been on many stages before, but this is absolutely super special. And I personally would like to thank all the staff who work tirelessly, and I think they deserve a big, massive round of applause. Thank you. And we, 
We get to tell these beautiful stories, but it doesn't end here. <laughs> yeah, this is not the end. This is just the beginning. The Oslo Freedom Forum is not just an event. It's a movement, a community, a family, a place where you find, where you meet friends, where you find allies. So keep the, keep the conversation going here and online. And uh, come back. Our next event are in Taiwan, Mexico City, and New York. And keep on uniting. Thank you. Thank See you, you next time. Bye. And now it is our distinct pleasure to close out today's theater sessions with a performance by El Sara and the Nubatones.
probably to not to do something besides saying politely. So it's up to you. We're doing whatever we're doing. Let's do it. <laughs> Baby.